painting is a fake. I've solved it. I figured it out. It's a fake. That's the answer. That's why they were killed. Now that's pretty impressive. Welcome to Watch Mojo UK, and today we'll be counting down our picks for the top 20 genius scenes in Sherlock. Before we begin, we publish new content every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. For this list, we'll be looking at various scenes in which characters, usually Sherlock, exhibit genius traits, astonishing intellect, and or impeccable planning. Basically, anything that made us respect the intelligence of the characters involved. And then how, did now, how did I break into the bank, to the tower, to the prison? Daylight robbery! All it takes is some willing participants. Number 20. Sussing out the safe. A scandal in Belgravia. That's not why I'm here. No, 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 you're here for the photographs, but that's never gonna happen. It seems like this that prove the brilliance of Sherlock and Watson as an investigative team. When Sherlock originally meets Irene Adler, he has extreme trouble reading into her due to her utter lack of clothing. But then Watson and Sherlock team up for a dazzling bit of deduction. Watson lights a magazine on fire in order to trigger the smoke alarm, leading Irene to nervously glance at the secret location of his safe. On hearing a smoke alarm, a mother would look towards her child. Amazing how fire exposes our priorities. Sherlock notices her glance, which in turn leads him to the safe in question. It doesn't require Sherlock's otherworldly intelligence, but it's nevertheless a very smart and very funny trick. It's masterful in its simplicity. Number 19, the nine million pound hairpin, the blind banker. How do you know that? You weren't just his PA, were you? At the end of the blind banker, Sherlock discovers that Van Coon and his secretary, Amanda, have been in a secret relationship, and he makes this deduction through simple hand soap. Sherlock finds an expensive brand of scented hand soap in Van Coon's apartment, which he figures is for a lady friend. Sorry. I don't think Eddie Van Coon was the type of chap to buy himself hand soap, not unless he had a lady coming over. And it's the same brand as that hand cream there on your desk. He also realizes that it's the exact same brand of hand cream that is used by Amanda. Put two and two together and you have a secret love affair. If that wasn't all, he also discovers that the treasure the kidnappers were after is actually a nine million pound hairpin that Van Coon had given to Amanda after his return from China. Oh? Huh? What's it worth? Nine million pounds. The exorbitant treasure was in her hair all along. Number 18, Mystery of the Dead Hiker. A scandal in Belgravia. Oh, shh, sh sh no. Don't get up. I'll do the talking. Even under sedation, Sherlock Holmes is much smarter than the average person. Soon after finding the hidden safe, Sherlock is drugged by Irene Adler, resulting in a fever dream in which he solves the mystery of the dead hiker using Adler as his guide. The car backfires and the hiker turns to look. Which was his big mistake. As a nearby car backfires, the hiker turned to investigate the sound, resulting in his boomerang slamming it into the back of his head and killing him instantly. There was no trace of the boomerang, as it had bounced into the nearby river and drifted downstream. It's very nice work by Dream Sherlock, and the entire sequence is aided by some hauntingly beautiful music and lots of visual splendor. Number 17, Studying the Lady in Pink. A study in pink. This was one of the first glimpses we received into the unnaturally perceptive mind of Sherlock Holmes, and what a tantalizing glimpse it was. Sherlock is brought to the crime scene of one Jennifer Wilson, who is lying dead with the word Raish scratched into the floor nearby. With the help of some visual clues, 
We follow along with Sherlock as he makes his clever observations. Victim is in her late 30s, professional person going by her clothes and guessing something in the media, going by the frankly alarming shade of pink. Travelled from Cardiff today, intending to stay in London for one night. It's obvious from the size of her suitcase. Suitcase? Suitcase, yes. Yeah, she's been married for at least 10 years. When Lestrade asks if he's found anything, and Sherlock gives his novel-sized explanation, we know exactly how he came to the answers. Oh, for God's sake, if you're just making this up... Her wedding ring, 10 years old at least. The rest of her jewellery has been regularly cleaned, but not her wedding ring. State of her marriage, right there. It wonderfully establishes character and the show's unique visual style. It's a brilliant bit of inference by Sherlock and a brilliant piece of filmmaking by the filmmakers. It's obvious, isn't it? It's not obvious to me. Dear God, what is it like in your funny little brains? It must be so boring. Number 16, Airline Seats. A scandal in Belgravia. What can you do, Mr. Holmes? Go on, press a girl. We have to keep going back to a scandal in Belgravia. It's just so darn good. In this scene, Irene approaches Sherlock and asks for his help in deciphering a code from the Ministry of Defense. This being from the Ministry of Defense, you'd think it'd be a tough nut to crack. But not for our dear Sherlock Holmes. There's a margin of error, but I'm pretty sure this is 7.47, leaving Heathrow tomorrow at 6.30 in the evening for Baltimore. Apparently it's going to save the world. I'm not sure how that could be true, but give me a moment. I've only been the case for eight seconds. In the time it takes Irene to kiss Sherlock, and for Watson to place his mug on the table, Sherlock discovers that the code is actually airline seat allocation numbers. Not only that, he figures out the exact flight, its departure time, and its destination. All from, well, from a lot of different things, actually. And assuming a British point of origin, which would be logical, considering the original source of the information, and assuming from the increased pressure on you lately that the crisis is imminent, the only flight that matches all the criteria and departs within the week is the 6.30 to Baltimore tomorrow evening from Heathrow Airport. It's amazing to witness. I would have you right here on this desk until you begged for mercy twice. Number 15, cracking Jennifer's phone. A study in pink. If you'd been murdered in your very last few seconds, what would you say? Please, God, let me live. Use your imagination. While studying Jennifer Wilson, aka the Lady in Pink, Sherlock discovers that she was scratching Rachel into the floorboards, but died before completing the L. They reckon that this is the name of her deceased daughter, but it's actually far more than that. Is it nice not being me? It must be so relaxing. Rachel is not a name. Then what is it? John, on the luggage there's a label, email address. Sherlock finds an email address on the tag of Jennifer's luggage and infers that she did business on her smartphone rather than a laptop. He uses the email address as her website username and deduces that Rachel is actually her password. So we can read her emails, so what? Anderson, don't talk out loud. You lower the IQ of the whole street. We can do much more than just read her emails. She had planted her phone on her killer in the desperate hope that someone would find them using its GPS signal. Number 14, the Mayfly Man, the sign of three. But more importantly, the Mayfly Man. The sign of three is an interesting episode in that it uses John and Mary's wedding as a catalyst to explore a variety of smaller cases. One concerns the so-called Mayfly Man, a man who impersonated deceased males and occupied their recently vacated apartments to have affairs with women. But the truth is actually far more complex. Sherlock discovers that the Mayfly Man actually courted women who worked for Major James Sholto. Ah, the photographer, excellent. Thank you. Uh, may I have a look at your camera? Uh, what's this about? I was halfway home. He used them to get info about Sholto's whereabouts so he could murder him in retaliation for his brother's death, who died under Sholto's command. He also manages to find the Mayfly Man posing as the wedding photographer. You only ever see. The camera. Even while serving as best man at a wedding, Sherlock is in tip top form. Number 13, Moriarty breaks into the crown jewels, the Reichenbach Fall. Sherlock saw his greatest opponent in Moriarty, who opens the season 2 finale in spectacular fashion. While posing as a tourist at the Tower of London, 
Moriarty uses nothing but his cell phone to shut down the tower's security, open the Bank of England's vaults, and unlock the cells at Pentonville Prison. Following that, he uses chewing gum, a diamond, and a fire extinguisher to shatter the glass surrounding the crown jewels. All that while turning Sherlock into a social pariah and a wanted man. In the end, we learn that Moriarty didn't actually utilize a fancy code to do all that, he just bribed security. You wanna hate villains, but Moriarty is just way too smart and way too much fun to hate. No rush. Number 12, The Guardsman. The sign of three. Now there is a man in there about to die. The game is on. Solve it! Another intriguing mystery found within the sign of three is that of the Queen's guardsman, Bainbridge. Bainbridge had supposedly been stabbed to death, but the lack of a weapon and escape route resulted in the case going cold. By the end of the episode, the case interconnects with the Mayfly Man and Sholto subplot that was previously discussed. Bainbridge had been stabbed with a stiletto blade, but his tight military waist belt had prevented him from suffering the effects. Don't take off your belt. My belt? His belt, yes. Bainbridge was stabbed hours before we even saw him, but it was through his belt. It isn't until his belt is loosened that the flesh part and the body reacts to the stabbing. Sherlock also concludes that the Mayfly Man had stabbed Bainbridge to practice his killing of Sholto. This type of dexterous storytelling is why we love Sherlock. I believe I am in need of medical attention. I believe I'm your doctor. Number 11, The Fake Vermeer, The Great Game. That painting has been subjected to every test, not to science. It's a very good fake then. You know about this, don't you? This is you, isn't it? While observing a supposed Johannes Vermeer painting, Sherlock receives a call from a child hostage telling him that he has 10 seconds to prove the painting is a forgery. What follows is perhaps the best 10 seconds of Sherlock history. Jesus. It's a fake. How can I prove it? How? 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 This kid will die. Tell me why the painting is a fake. Tell me! No, shut up. Don't say anything. Only works if I figure it out. He eventually finds that the painting depicts the so-called Van Buren supernova, which was observed on Earth in 1858. Therefore, it couldn't have been possible for Vermeer to paint the supernova in the 17th century. This is actually a case of artistic license, as there is no such supernova that was observed in 1858. Exploding star only appeared in the sky in 1858. So how could it have been painted in the 1640s? Regardless, it's a wonderful and exciting conclusion that caps a wickedly tense sequence. Number 10, Capturing Smith's Confession. The Lying Detective. Once more, for luck. I don't want to die. I don't. Introduced in Series 4, Toby Jones's Culverton Smith cuts a shifty and suspicious kind of character from the off, despite his philanthropic and entrepreneurial reputation. And it didn't take Sherlock long to twig Smith's true villainy, capturing his confession with a perfectly laid trap. Killing human beings. <laughs> it just makes me oh, incredibly happy. Thanks to Watson's predictable nature and a cleverly planted recording device in his walking stick, Smith incriminates himself beyond dispute. Of course, much hinges on John arriving to save Sherlock so that the confession can be released, but that was never in doubt either. Mr. Holmes, you okay? What are you doing? What were you doing? Number nine, meeting Kitty Riley. The Reichenbach Fall. You're him. First impressions are everything, and Sherlock knows that better than most. Here he runs into a supposed superfan, but he immediately works out the ruse. Kitty Riley's in fact a journalist looking for the latest scoop on one of the UK's most elusive characters. Better forgive away. It's my just deliverance to see if I'm as good as they say I am. Of course, Sherlock never takes too kindly to the press, and he promptly puts Riley in her place with some typically astute comments on her look and demeanor. The whole scene sizzles with intensity as each tries to outplay the other. 
But there's only one winner here. I'll give you a quote if you like three little words. You repel me. Number eight, Van Coon's murder. The blind banker. Do you want me to buzz you in? Yeah, and can I use your balcony? What? After a break in at a bank where all the assailants did was leave graffiti on a painting, Sherlock's asked to investigate, and the trail soon leads him to break into Edward Van Coon's flat, where he finds Van Coon dead. Watson and the rest of the police rule suicide until Sherlock deduces otherwise. Oh, good, you follow. Nope. The super sleuth explains how Van Coon's apparent obvious left handedness makes it very unlikely that he shot himself rattling through a list of simple but brilliant observations to back up his theory. And there's some trademark sarcasm just for good measure. Do you want me to go on? No, I think you've covered oh, I might as well. I'm almost at the bottom of the list. There's a knife on the breadboard with butter on the right side of the blade. Number 7, London Maps. A study in pink. Left turn only, traffic lights. Sherlock's got one hell of a memory, on top of everything else, which he uses to solve this case in the show's first ever episode. Chasing a taxi through the streets of London, with Watson just about keeping up, he employs a photographic knowledge of the city, including the latest roadworks and diversions, to eventually catch his target. The scene does leave one question unanswered, though. Why does Holmes use cabs as frequently as he does if he can travel just as quickly on foot? Seems like a waste of fair money. Sorry, are you guys the police? Yeah. Everything all right? Number six, I am Sherlocked. A scandal in Belgravia. Uh, Jim Moriarty sends his love. Yes, he's been in touch. We're picking apart passwords next, as Sherlock's faced with the four-digit code to Irene Adler's infamous phone. And with apparently endless combinations in front of him, we spend the entire episode trying to figure out what it is. Nicely played. No. Sorry? I said no. As usual, the actual solution is so painfully simple that we're kicking ourselves for not realizing it sooner, as Sherlock's thrown into an unexpectedly emotional exchange. I've always assumed that love is a dangerous disadvantage. Thank you for the final proof. The I am Sherlock line quickly became a mantra for the show, and understandably so. Number 5, Sherlock gets shot. His last vow. Sherlock's no stranger to injury, but he usually escapes fairly unscathed. Until Mary shows up, that is. Just as we find out Mary isn't all she claims to be, she goes and shoots our gifted detective. But things are never simple in this show. Not even point-blank bullet wounds. If the bullet had passed through you, what would you have heard? The mirror shattering. Time seems to stop and Sherlock has seconds to determine how to fall to reduce the damage done. An ultra-intense moment, with viewers begging him to think fast, Holmes's ability to make the right call was never really in doubt, was it? Number 4, The Mind Palace. The Hounds of Baskerville. Something buried deep. Get out. Seeming like an ultra-logic superpower, Holmes's Mind Palace stores all of his memories and every piece of seemingly pointless information he's ever encountered. Quite unbelievably, it's actually a legitimate memory technique, although Sherlock's is much bigger, more effective, and more extravagant than anyone else's could ever be, naturally. Tapping the palace for this scene, it takes him mere seconds to solve a huge piece of the Hounds of Baskerville mystery, shining light on significant details his brilliant brain has always had access to. Hound. He just needs to cut through the chaos. Number 3, Meeting Watson. A study in pink. Well, you're the second person to say that to me today. Who's the first? A huge moment at the start of the series, this scene establishes the Holmes-Watson friendship. Serving as our introduction to both characters too, it's where we learn John's backstory and it's when we get our first look at just how brilliant Sherlock really is. Afghanistan or Iraq. Watson arrives and Sherlock instantly deduces that he's an army man with family issues. It's enough to be going on with, don't you think? 
Later, John's bemusement turns to amazement when Sherlock explains exactly how he came to those near-perfect conclusions. We can't forgive him for that brother-sister slip-up. He's still human after all. Spot on, and I didn't expect to be right about everything. Harry's short for Harriet. Number two, faking his death. The Reichenbach Fall. Sherlock! For one of the biggest surprises in the entire show, Sherlock jumps to his death at the end of series two. Or he seems to, at least. We soon learn that the sleuth is still alive, but how did he do it? Oh no, you. Oh yes. Oh my god. I'm not going. You died, you jumped off a roof. No. Fans had to wait two theory filled years to find out, with the first episode of season three proposing multiple possibilities, including a plan involving a Sherlock mask, Darren Brown, and a bungee cord, and another hinging on a giant crash mat. I needed to hit the airbag, which I did. It's all about ambiguity here, though with some fans still unconvinced by Sherlock's version of events. What do you think? Number one, the couple in the pub. The Hounds of Baskerville. Henry's right. Well, I saw it too. It's not often that Sherlock shows his emotions, but here his straight-faced facade slips just for a second, so he starts to question his most valuable asset, his mind. But just because he's scared doesn't mean he's not still brilliant, and he proves this by deconstructing a random couple nearby. Where should we start? How about them? Revealing everything from their familial relationship to the breed of the lady's pet dog, he's very clearly still in control, turning simple observations into spectacular details. She's got a man's wedding ring on a chain around her neck, clearly her late husband's too big for her finger. She's well dressed, but her jewelry's cheap. She could afford better. In case we didn't know it by now, nothing phases this guy. Not even a supposedly supernatural killer hound. The solution is always within his grasp. So you see, I am fine if I didn't have been better, so just leave me alone. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Watch Mojo UK, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.